In the last chapters of the four Gospels, Jesus Christ of Nazareth gave us, gave his disciples and us, which are his disciples, including you and me, that church's great commission. Matthew 28, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. This is after he had, uh, was crucified and he was resurrected back to life again. In Mark 16, the last part of it, go you into all the world, verse 15, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs that shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Verse 19, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God the Father. And they went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord, wor the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And then at the end of Luke, chapter 24, starting at verse 45 through 53, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with the power from on high. I'll just read, and then he led in verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Finally, at the end of John, in chapter 21, verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto them, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. And he said unto them, Feed my lambs. He said unto them again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto them, to him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was kind of grieved at that time because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love you. Jesus said unto him, Then feed my sheep. So that's one of the part of our commission, is to feed God's people. In verse 20 it says, Then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple John, whom Jesus loved following, loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that... Which is he? And said, Lord, which is he that Peter seeing him says to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt but he if thou wilt that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus didn't say to him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? This is a disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one of them, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written of him. The lesson's clear with that little episode in John, with Peter's focus on John. And it's like this, when the disciples came to Christ, when they saw another group of men that was casting out demons in Christ's name, and Christ told them not to worry about them, to, con to concentrate on the job that was set before them, for themselves. And he chastened Peter to not worry about how Christ will work with another man and to, con to concentrate on the work Peter was instructed to do. We are just part of 
many other churches that are around the world that are doing the same work of God and know the truth of God. We don't concentrate on those other churches. We concentrate on what we have and the people that we have. Our job given to us by Christ 2,000 years ago has not changed. If we have convinced one person about the truth of God, then we have done well. Now to complete our commission from Jesus Christ of Nazareth, all we have left to convince is a little over 7 billion more people. So we still have a couple more to go. <laughs> this sermon is to try to give all of us insight on how we are to go into all the world and fulfill that commission that God gave you in, in his church. The commission we are given seems to be getting more and more difficult because of one of the main prophecies concerning the end time that's coming to pass right before our eyes. Iniquity and lawlessness in every one. God says it will abound, meaning it will increase and will cause the love of many to wax cold. That's in Matthew 24, 12. The more we see it, the more we need to talk about it, I think. Laws and principles cannot be denied, and yet mankind, influenced by Satan and his demons, will try more and more to do away with law. Now, you and I believe in God without question, and I also believe, like you, in science. As of late, I believe in the science of medicine, and we know this through the viruses and everything else that we go through. And what cannot be denied are the laws of physics or the laws of science. These laws are everywhere, visible and invisible. One of the invisible laws that we are sure of is gravity. The negative law of the virus that we see around us is also invisible. We cannot see it, but we can see what it does. When Jesus Christ returns, these physical laws that we live with daily will still be here for at least a thousand years. But along with the Ten Commandments, God's holy days, etc., the people of this world that are left alive, including ourselves, will need to live by all of God's laws and principles that we are not living by today. Just like God had to re-educate Israel, the same he's going to have to do with the rest of this world. Prime example is the law of the land and giving it rest every seven years. The law of Jubilee, which is every 50 years. A few years ago, Tom talked about that law of restoration within the context of the Exodus series. And it, Tom expounded on that law of restoration to restore this earth back into its original condition before Jesus Christ presents this planet to his father. Turn to Isaiah chapter 61. When we break something, sometimes we can fix it. But of course, more often than not, many of the things we break cannot be fixed. Naturally, when that happens, we discard our trash, or trash it rather, and purchase a new one. Some things just wear out, get old or out of date, and so we replace it with a new and improved or upgrade one. With you and I working alongside with Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his, and his established kingdom on this earth, we will be given 1,000 years to rebuild what's broken. So I suggest to keep your tools. God says in the second half of verse 2 in Isaiah chapter 61, Christ said it will be the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste places, the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many, many generations. Again, hold on to your tools and hammers. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double. And for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, he says, love judgment, and I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, 
and they that are the seed which the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Verse 11 says, For as the earth brings forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Even after the return of Jesus Christ, we're going to have a lot of work to do and a lot of people to teach. People will still have that human nature inside of them, and they will have that to overcome. But the thing, the beautiful thing is that Satan will no longer be around to influence nor any of his demons. When the kingdom of God is established, the educational system will change around the world. We'll be following God's laws. Though man has tried since the Tower of Babel to establish a one world government, quote unquote, and still trying, a one world government will be coming soon. And this king of that one world government will be Christ. Meanwhile, Christ said in Matthew 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, he says, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not you that speaks, but the spirit of your father which speaks in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For truly I say to you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So if we think that we have gotten all this good news out to all the people of the earth, Christ said that we're wrong about that, and he knows better. Without knowledge of God, a person's higher education can really get in the way of their spirit of humbleness and their spiritual growth and their understanding of God. And that's been one of the setbacks in God's church trying to teach the people of the world who have visited the church. How many times have we tried to hold a conversation with such people like that? People who have degrees in science, technology, doctors and teachers, etc. It seems as if they speak an entirely different language if our knowledge doesn't quite equal or match to their higher standard like theirs. Not many wise men, quote unquote, or noble are called. Though there are a few exceptions to that rule, a person who is accustomed to the higher sciences all their adult life without proper knowledge of God have a very different mindset when it comes to the subject of God, to the subject of religion, the subject of faith, belief, etc. To the majority of people with this type of upbringing without God in their early years of life, it is impossible to convince them of any kind of biblical spiritual truth. Quote, if a deceived person knew they were deceived, then they no longer would be deceived. Turn to Romans chapter 1. There is hope yet for the world of the well-educated type of people I'm talking about, but it's going to take another approach in order to give them a very different perspective. Satan's way of keeping a poor and uneducated person away from the truth of God is to concentrate on their weaknesses and to use that weakness by exposing them to more of their substances that caused their sin to begin with. In other words, making it more and more easily available as much as possible within his power to do so, as God will allow, though. The rich and well-educated are on Satan's opposite extreme. God is too unreal to them. Actually, God is laughable when you try to talk to them about something spiritual. They have become too proud in their successes that they alone have accomplished, they think. In Romans 1, verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth 
and unrighteousness, because that which they which, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it to them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without any excuse. God is as real as the law of gravity. His laws, physical and spiritual laws, reveal who he is. Colossians chapter 1. The letter from Paul to the Colossians chapter 1. Here he begins by speaking of Jesus Christ, breaking into the middle of it. He continues in verse 15. Jesus Christ, he's speaking of, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In a nutshell, that gives you exactly who Christ was, way before the universe was created. He was there. Second Peter 3, at the end of that letter, tells us, and to always remember that, that what has gone on before with the prophets of ancient Israel and never forget, in verse 3, 2 Peter 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. In verse 4, and they'll be saying, where is this promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. These negative attitudes in these last days, such as we read throughout the scriptures, they're going to increase more and more. More scoffers will ridicule what we preach and teach because they are not stupid to the fact that we have had wars and world troubles since the beginning of history, those who know history. They, they have even grown accustomed to the increase in all of these troubles, that new norm that we're going through today. Even many that were from God's church have fallen away and back into this world. They have forgotten. They have forgotten laws and principles that break us when we break them. They have forgotten the simple law of physics of two opposite forces when once they were a positive godly force on this earth. The negative will be attracted to the positive is the law. Still, they have forgotten that God is above the law. God has created all laws, visible and invisible. Jesus Christ of Nazareth actually defined as created a law of gravity when he walked on water. And because of this, verse 5, they willingly are ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. They willfully do not want to remember certain parts of history. God's history book. Even some today are in denial of actual recent historical events that, was shaped, that actually shaped our society that we live in. From the time they were born into a ready-made Microwave, smartphone world with Google at their fingertips for all knowledge, things never really happen unless the internet, of course, tells them it happened. Recent history to many has no relevance, let alone ancient history. And the world's oldest history book is your Bible. In verse 6, whereby the world that was then, that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Who is it that sustains this wobbling earth and its orbit? Who keeps it turning at the exact speed on its exact 25.3 tilted axis at its exact distance from the sun? The same one who has also reserved, quote, the earth unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. John chapter 5. There is coming a day of judgment by God, and the Bible speaks of that day many, many times. Jesus Christ warns us not to judge another man. Jesus Christ will do that for us. John 5, verse 21, rather. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. A lot of, a lot of people that we know like to speak for God. 
They think God enacts as a judgment or punishment on people today. And then they get confused when God doesn't punish some injustice that happens. We witnessed ourselves how soon after Katrina that we heard men complaining that they knew that God did it or after any calamity. He heard, we heard also how evil New Orleans was because of that Katrina hurricane. And yet we also know that the French Quarter and all the bars were spared. Go figure. What would Christ say to these men that say all these things? If you turn to Luke chapter 13, we'll see what Christ would say in that example. In verse 1 of Luke 13, there were present at that season someone that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. In the context of this message from Jesus Christ is the entire previous chapter, so we'll also make a note of chapter 12. He was not only speaking of these few who were reminding him of what Pilate did, but he was also speaking to a multitude of people plus his disciples. In verse 2, And Jesus answering said to them, Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Jesus Christ knew their thoughts before they even spoke. And many times there were religious leaders and such that were mixed in with the crowd. And they were there who constantly trying to trap him in some, some way. And their goal, of course, in the end was to kill him. As 100% human as well as the Son of God, Christ was a pure descendant of David, the King of Israel. He has some of the same characteristic, and he was also a young man during his ministry. Christ didn't hold back and could get angry, yet without sinning. And like I said, make a note of chapter 12 and read that one. In verse 2 again, of the chapter 12 of chapter uh, 13, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you really think that those Galileans sin more than any other Galilean? And that's why they die like that. He says, I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus Christ, the God of the Old Testament, he knows history because he was there. He adds, Verse 4, of the, or those 18, upon whom the tower of Solomon fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise have perish. In Matthew chapter 7, we turn there. What was the main message from God to mankind? To repent, to stop and change directions. And why? Because the end of this world's governance is coming to a head, and it's inevitable that they will end. The good news is we will have a one world government with one king, Christ. And this king, they will see, will be coming from outer space. No one can stop it from happening, no matter how much they believe. In Matthew chapter 7, Christ said, number, uh, verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, it would be safer for us to actually do unto others as you would have others do unto you. In verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how would thou say to your brother, Let me pull out the mote out of your eye, and behold, a beam is, your own, is in your own eye. He says, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast out the mote out of your brother's eye. Turn to Romans chapter 2. As we become closer to God in our learning and grace when the knowledge of his truth, our human nature still remains inside of us. As time goes on with our walk with God and his law, we develop a certain perspective towards unconverted friends and family. I used to be very, very judgmental towards others who kept the quote-unquote pagan holidays in the early years of my conversion. I had forgotten how much I used to love the holidays, the Christmases, the Easter eggs, the crabs and the crawfish. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are that judges for wherein, wherein thou judgest another, you condemnest yourself. For you that judges does the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. He says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and you do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? 
or despise you the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Christ said, seek the kingdom of God first and foremost to make it our number one in our list of priorities. Follow the laws that will govern that kingdom and learn them. Develop a relationship with the king's father, and that king's father is Jesus Christ. The king is Christ, and his father, we don't know his name, but that his father is in heaven who is not, we have not seen yet. And know that he is being good to us because that goodness helps us sojourn within a world that is not his yet. For now it is Satan's world. In 1 Peter 4, verse 17, is a great reminder why we need to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 17 in 1 Peter 4, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? As we become closer and closer to God, we are no longer of this world. Jesus Christ knows this because he said it himself. He prayed for you and I that his Father and their power would keep us from the evil that's in this world. And that's in his prayer of John 17 that we read each year at the Passover. God will work with us as we follow what he has instructed us to do. In the context of Matthew 11, Jesus Christ of Nazareth went out from the city to city preaching and teaching and doing many, many miracles. The people actually saw the healing of the blind, those that were lame all their life, standing and walking, and many, many more miracles that were not even written in the book of the Bible. Christ knew the hearts and the minds of the multitude of people that witnessed who he was, but they still didn't believe after all of what they saw. It's amazing. Verse 20 tells us that because they would not repent, change their minds and quit sinning, he became just a little upset. He chides them in these cities in verse 21. Woe unto thee, Chorazaran, woe unto thee, Basita, for if the, the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. He says in verse 22, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which was are exalted unto heaven, you shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Capernaum was a very, very rich city. Remember the city of Tyre from Ezekiel 26? Remember Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened to them? Verse 24, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now, that's pretty bad, pretty harsh words from Christ. Christ did not sin, but he was still upset. He had the human feelings just like you and I have human feelings. He knew he was upset, and the very next verse gives us the perfect example for what we should do when we are feeling that upset. Quickly communicate to God because this world will make us mad enough to bring out the human in all of us. Verse 25 says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent, and you revealed them unto babes. This verse also tells us some of the characters, characters rather, in the multitude that he was preaching to and teaching. Verse 26, for Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Speaking of you and I, read the rest of that chapter in your own mind. I don't care how big the bat or the two by four you have in your hand that has the word truth written on the end of it. You can hit somebody as hard as you want in the head and it still won't get to them. There are some very, very smart, stupid human beings out there. Yet we have to keep trying. God told us to not grow weary in well-doing. Doing. And why did he tell us that? Because we can grow weary in well-doing. But the commission given to us from Christ himself must not stop. How do we keep going? By picking each other up within God's congregation and his people. 
by letting Christ pick us up in our thankful prayers and our thoughts, by getting comfort through the scriptures, by understanding that you have been given by God's grace and mercy, his truth ordained and set apart from this world. <laughs> Verse 28 says, come unto me all you that, are la that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. From the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church in chapter 1 of his first letter to the Corinthians at the end, you can review who we are and our calling from God. In chapter 2, Paul reminds the people that the things they have learned of God's truth cannot be credited by human wisdom at all. He says that spiritual realities are not discoverable by human wisdom. In verse 9 it says, But as it, is, as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural man, man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are a foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's how we understand some of the people that we talk to, that we go with that blank stare when we try to teach them God's truth. Later in chapter 9, he vindicates his apostleship, then instructs them that, them that those who preach the truth of God should also live by the truth of God. And later in verse 19, he gives us a simple clue on how we can go about talking to those who sincerely have questions concerning God's truth. He says, for though I be free from all men, verse 19, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. In verse 20, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, I became as like I was under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Sometimes we, as God's people who are graced with the knowledge of his truth, need to talk to others on their level and not be too high-minded with our, our talk with them. Check your ego and your human nature at the door when you do talk to them. Put yourself in their shoes, verse 23. And this I do for the, people, for the gospel's sake, rather, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run, that ye may obtain it. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that, beats, that just beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I should find myself to be a castaway. I don't care how much you think you know or how much you do good in this world, it is only by God's grace and his choice, not yours. Depart from me, I never knew you. That's some scary statement by Christ. And we don't ever want to hear that. Be careful for nothing. Newton's first law of motion in relation to gravity is interesting. It says, everybody, which is talking of matter, everybody continues in its, in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it, unquote. The beginning sentence of this article that I read about Newton's laws 
says this is sometimes called the law of inertia or just inertia. Essentially, it makes the following two points. An object that is not moving will not move until a force acts upon it. An object that is in motion will not change velocity, including stopping, until a force acts upon it. Now, we know that God's Holy Spirit is an invisible force, and it keeps us moving. So you compare that with the law of gravity and law of matter. In 1 Timothy 1.17, you don't have to turn there, it says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. In Hebrews 11.27, you don't have to turn there either. By faith, he, talking about Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. As the people of God, we can see the analogy of God working in us through the physical laws that he has created. To repent means to stop going in the direction that you're going in. Turn around and to go the other way. And make sure it's God's way. In Matthew 23, 37, Christ said to the very people that were about to kill him, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killed the prophets and stoned them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under their wings, and you would not? Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament that dealt with the house of Israel back in the Old Testament days. He was the one who sent the prophets and whom they killed. Excuse me. In verse 11 in Isaiah chapter 1, to what purpose? Is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? This is God speaking, says the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of a fed beast. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. New, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yet when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. The God that said this later told the scribes and Pharisees that they had forgotten the weightier matters of the law. You can read that subject matter in Matthew 23 because this is Jesus Christ who said this. As we examine our nation and judge the wisdom of our leaders or the lack thereof, let us also examine ourselves, since judgment first, must first begin with us in the church of God. We need to have a constant awareness of ourselves. Yes, there is blood on the hands of many, many of our leaders. They have allowed some things to happen that could have been prevented. They have lied to us. They have chosen not to speak out against the true causes of our decline in America. They teach us to tolerate the cruel wrongdoings that we see going on around us. For fear of losing face with their constituents, they have replaced good with evil. Politics stands tall and corrected, though. But to us who understand the spiritual realities of this world, we are held to a higher accountability. We are responsible for what we know, God's truth. And God warns us too often throughout his book that we are his watchmen. Ezekiel 33 makes it clear and reinforces our commission. Make a note of that chapter as well and study it. Continuing in verse 16 of Isaiah 1, God simplifies how we prepare ourselves. God looks at the intent of the heart. He says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, God says. But God is not a fearful monster, as some believe. He admonishes in verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Remember what you silently read and you reread in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Christ says. 
He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the book of Amos chapter 5, you can finally turn there. You don't have to bring yourself up to God's level. That's impossible. He has already brought himself down to ours, even unto his death. That's Jesus Christ. You can simply talk to him in prayer and ask him anything. Learn about him, is what we just read. Learn of me, he says. Amos 5, verse 4, For thus says the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Verse 6, Seek the Lord, and ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Verse 8 says, Seek him that makes the seven stars in Orion, and turns the shadow of death into morning, and makes the day darken with night, that calls for the waters of the sea, and pours them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Verse 13, therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, talking about the end time, for it is an evil time. Down to verse 18, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, verse 8, 19, or went into a house and leaned his hand against the wall and the serpent bit him. Closer and closer and closer, we're getting to the end and the return of Jesus Christ is coming no matter what you believe or what you read or hear from anybody else. The time we're living in is going to intensify with the evil that we see around us. And just like I just read, it seems like as we escape one bad thing, another thing happens. And those things God only can protect us from. It is only through God's protection that you and your family will survive. You have to keep watching and keep praying always. Yeah.